and welcome to our panel on TTIP, Emerging Markets and the Multilateral Trading System. We've got um, four, soon to be five, uh, top uh, experts in DC on the subject. Uh, you've all got the bios, uh, but first we've got uh, Dan Eichson from the Cato Institute, uh, Dr. Susan Aronson uh, from George Washington University, Peter Rashish from the Transnational Strategy Group, and Dr. Joshua Walker uh, from APCOR Worldwide. Uh, we've had a very interesting uh, discussion this morning, uh, earlier on this afternoon, about some of the geopolitical implications between the US uh, and the EU on TTIP, and now we're looking at the, the wider uh, global uh, perspectives. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I appreciate being invited here. So I, I assume we each have about, what, seven or eight minutes? Yeah. Since we've got to move, move through this. Now I'm going to discredit myself at the outset by saying I haven't written very much uh, or studied the TTIP uh, all that much yet. I've written two small papers and a few blog posts and a couple of op-eds. But then again, uh, the TTIP, in my opinion, is pretty far uh, from completion. And there were other things in its way. Uh, of course, the TPA, which we've heard a little bit about today. Uh, which seems to, some legislation seems to be embraced by Congress, at least by the Finance Committee. We'll see what happens with it. And then there's TPP. Uh, and I think that's kind of reflected in the, in the negotiations to a certain extent. I think um, the Europeans have been much more focused on TTIP than have the Americans because, well, we're distracted or we're playing hard to get. Uh, there's a certain benefit, I think, to that. Um, but what I have noticed um, about the TTIP negotiation so far, and Peter and I were just joking about this, is that it is a bit of a jobs program. Uh, you'll see there's, there, there are tons of people employed in Washington attending these kinds of events. <laughs> and my concern has, all along has been that it's going to turn into this transatlantic 10-year cocktail party unless we get some substance and, and, and move forward. Um, so the theme of this panel really was you know, what, how uh, the TTIP might advance multilateralism and what, how we might uh, uh, re reduce antagonism toward developing countries. But let me just say, um, challenge that by saying, we're, I think we're putting the cart before the horse to a certain extent. Um, we heard before that we're going to get this done on a single tank of gas. This was back when it was launched in 2013. Uh, we're going to get it done by the end of 2014. Now by the end of 2015. I mean, I really think this is se several years off, and this is going to be baton passed to the next administration for sure. Uh, and we need to think about that. Uh, right now, a lot of issues that were on the very ambitious agenda at the outset seem to be totally off the table. Audio visuals are uh, off the table. The U.S. doesn't want financial services on it. And there are very contentious issues that seem to me to be almost intractable and possibly likely to fall off of the agenda. Uh, and that includes data localization and, pri and, and privacy, uh, GMOs. There seem to be some pretty entrenched positions on that. Uh, uh, GIs, uh, geographic indicators. ISDS has obviously caused a lot of uh, pushback from uh, the European public in particular. The Jones Act here in the US. Uh, government procurement, what's going to be on it? Are the states going to be par part of that? Uh, and ultimately, what is the definition of regulatory coherence, regulatory harmonization? That has been the emphasis of most people, where most people are pointing to to that chapter as where the, the greatest gains are going to come from. But it seems that it hasn't been all that well defined yet. Uh, and the US is focusing on process. The Europeans are focusing more on, on regulations themselves. Um, a couple years ago, a paper came out by Bertelsmann and the Atlantic Foundation, Atlantic Council, um, which was a, reflected a survey of experts on both sides of the Atlantic and identified the uh, most important issues and the most difficult to resolve. And I, I would submit now that, and so they had it on a quadrant, on a, 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 on a matrix. I, I think now many of those issues are probably more difficult to resolve than they were uh, at that point. Um, even energy export liberalization in the US, which should be a no-brainer, uh, has generated a lot of resistance here. Um, so uh, what about the fresh start? We have had a fresh start, apparently. Does anybody, has anybody noticed? Yeah, we, we have a new commissioner in, in the EU. There has been a greater focus on um, transparency, I think. Uh, but at some point, we need some real substantive changes. I've put forward this idea. It's not been uh, embraced. Uh, maybe it will be. 
this idea of instead of doing the single undertaking, to do this in a multiple staged uh, event, like a three tranches. Because if we're going to put everything in one basket, this is going to take several, se several years, and it's, it's possible that it won't be attainable. I, I think if we go for the low-hanging fruit every two years and, 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 and just uh, and pocket the gains, uh, we could still have the horse trading that seems to be needed to, 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 to make these agreements work. But there will just be fewer things on the table in each tranche. So anyway, at some point, policymakers might send me an email and say, all right, elaborate a little bit. But I've, I've had the, the idea out there for a while, and I haven't gotten too, too many uh, comments. Um, so really, the question here was, will TTIP be a catalyst for multilateral efforts uh, to liberalize trade? Um, certainly, non-discriminatory non rules are better uh, than preferential arrangements. There's no less trade, trade diversion. Uh, there are fewer rules, to costs of compliance, which are, can become difficult. Um, but the WTO has failed as a negotiating body. Uh, it's really never produced, uh, and it, it produced a, a couple of plurilateral agreements, uh, but, but not, not much more than that. Um, mm. Considering that the US and EU account for almost 50% of global GDP, and about one third of, of trade transactions involve the US or EU, in some sense, it, it's a preferential agreement, but it's not so preferential. It's not so non-discriminatory because uh, increased trade is going to benefit other countries naturally. Two-thirds two of global trade is intermediate goods and there are lots of developing countries in our supply chains, in European supply chains, who will benefit by virtue of the fact that there will be greater economies of scale, uh, there are greater scope for specialization, uh, demand will increase in both the US and, and Europe and that will benefit developing countries. Um, I think TTIP is going to inspire a good run of unilateral liberalization among developing countries to get themselves ready to be, be part of these global value chains or to be better positioned uh, to be a part of these global chains. Unilateral liberalization is you know, it's sort of political taboo, certainly in Washington, but it has gone on for years. And in the run-up to the launch of the Doha round, Many, many countries engaged in these domestic reforms, which is unilateral liberalization. We had Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, China, Mexico, India. And lots of this was going on until Doha was launched. And at that point, these, these reforms that were in government's interests became negotiating chits, and they stopped reforming. I think there is an incentive for them to, I think TTIP provides an incentive for governments to engage in their own reforms because every country is competing with one another for investment and to be part of these supply chains. I know pr we're pretty short on time here, so I'll, I'll, I'll just rip through a couple of these. Um, uh, so uh, can, can, can TTIP inspire the, this kind of liberalization? Yes. Uh, I think we've seen it already happen. I think, after all, TTIP is, was born of the TPP, really. Uh, a lot of Atlanticists will say, you know, eventually a transatlantic deal was going to emerge. It's been in the works for, I don't know, 50, 60 years. Uh, but it was the TPP, really, that, in, that was the, the catalyst for the TTIP. And I think the TTIP can certainly be the catalyst for the WTO. The WTO works well as, a, uh, as a, an adjudicative body. It can't work anymore as a negotiating body. There are too many countries at disparate levels of economic development. And... Uh, it should focus on perhaps adopting best practices from the TTIP. And there are specialists around Washington and Brussels and in other capitals trying to figure out ways to make, make that happen. Certainly we should make it, the TTIP should include some sort of an accession provision, I don't think it does yet, um, that spells out how other countries, how, how China can exceed, how India eventually, Brazil. But I think at the outset, it makes sense for Mexico and Canada to be involved and also perhaps Turkey. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of integration already, and it makes and, and, and Canada and the EU just completed their agreement, and uh, so it makes very little sense for Canada to be in a different agreement from the United States in that sense. So, uh, one last point: um, the harmonization of standards, um, the mutual uh, recognition. The, th that issue, I'm sorry, is very important, um, and that can be done in a very liberalizing way. Uh, if you have mutual recognition or harmonization of standards where you agree to allow third parties to send their goods to your market as long as they comport with one standard or the other, or the, the common uh, one, then uh, 
that's quite liberalizing, and I think we need to focus on that, and there will be less resistance. Stop there. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Susan. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the invite, and thank you all for coming. So I, I'm taking a very different approach to this, um, one that Dan's actually heard a couple of times at other TTIP conferences. But basically, I want to look at the geoeconomic implications of TTIP. I, I, my research looks at the relationship between trade and human rights. In particular, I'm interested in digital rights. But today, what I'd like to talk about is, although um, I'm a multilateralist, if there's one FTA I'd like to see, it's TTIP. And the reason that I say that is because we have these hopes that TTIP will become a gold standard for other future trade agreements. Okay? And the reason that TTIP should be a gold standard is to basically make Western, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but Western standards, if you will, these standards that other countries aim to, should they accede to a TTIP type, or should the WTO move forward? OK. But I think it's not just important to focus on the what, but how we do the negotiation. And that is the focus of my talk today. If you were to examine what the US and the EU are negotiating, they have a basically a 24-chapter model. And of that trade agreement model, Nine of those chapters relate to what I'd call regulatory issues. OK. And since the US and the EU comprise among the world's dominant democracies, how they negotiate it is very important, right? So if they're talking about things that are issues of governance, such as the environment, labor standards, information flows, then how they negotiate it has to be done in a democratic, transparent, and accountable manner. OK, so what are we trying to do with TTIP? If we can find this common ground, not only would that be helpful to businesses in the EU, which have some regulatory problems, if you will, but their goal is to create employment, right? Because there is significant unemployment in, in the EU, many EU countries. And that's certainly true in the United States. I'm the mother of a college graduate who's struggled to find a job. And I do believe that if we do this right, we can create more jobs. OK, but again, how we do it is really important. And just as the internet and 20th century expectations have changed how we govern, how we find jobs, and how we meet our spouses, trade policy making has to change. Just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean that in the 21st century we do it this way. We have to do it this way. Now, there are certain things related to national security or business conf confidential information that shouldn't change. Those negotiations need to remain in secret. But when you're talking about regulatory issues, which were decided in a democratic, transparent, and accountable manner, you can't change that in a secretive manner. And so for those reasons, I feel that the United States, in particular, needs to change how it's doing these negotiations. So let me make some recommendations. The first recommendation I want to make is to work towards coherence. You go to USTR and you say to them, hmm, have you noticed that the labor chapters in some FTAs um, contradict with objectives in the regulatory coherence chapter or investment chapters? And they'll say, oh, we do a screen uh, to make sure that's not true. But then I can give them several examples where, in fact, there is contradictory language. So I think the first thing is if you're going to work towards regulatory coherence, you have to also work towards ensuring that the chapters are coherent, um, OK? Because otherwise, you're never going to get to that gold standard. And I'll be pleased to elaborate if anyone would like to ask me a question about it. Number two, this is a governance agreement. We all talk about it as if it's only about trade. But that's really not telling the truth about what we do when we negotiate trade. And I think since really civics classes are changing to meet 21st century expectations of governance. And we now have state standards where in my home state, Virginia, they do talk about how Virginia has always been a leading exporter and what we trade and how we trade. We need to also talk about what trade agreements do. 
And they regulate how and when governments can apply tools of protectionism like tariffs, but also regulations that can uh, discriminate between foreign and domestic producers. Again, if they're governance agreements, we need to talk about them as such. And what we're trying to do is create a regulatory race to the top. OK, speaking of a race to the top, it seems to me that the United States needs to learn from what the EU has been trying to do, which is to involve, A, involve more of its public in the dialogue about trade, and B, to make its positions more transparent. Um, so why not compete with the EU to make the negotiations more transparent? You can do so without jeopardizing business or um, national security, as long as you don't include, though, you know, those don't need to be made more transparent. Finally, the United States, I think, has done a very good job of trying to create a feedback loop on one side of it, right? We use the Federal Register and we use Congress to ask the public, it's just the concerned public, what do you think? But then there's no accountability related to that. USTR never says, we've heard you, here's what we're going to do in response, mm -hmm. right? And part of that is USTR does have an excuse because Congress is the one that sets the goal for what we're supposed to do for trade policy, right, in TPA. And we haven't had TPA since 2002. But nonetheless, I think USTR needs to take a leading role in being accountable to the public. Moreover, so I would suggest a couple of things. Why not try crowdsourcing, which, by the way, many EU agencies have done, and the US has started to experiment with. What do I mean by that? Ask the public a question. How do we empower unions or individuals in the global economy using services? An answer to that might be to allow individuals to compete across borders, offering their services across borders. Right? Firms can do that. Why can't individuals do that? I'm just suggesting that as a possible question. See what answers come up. Okay. Another one would be, how can we balance different nations' regimes for privacy um, with when we obligate free flow of information in trade agreements? Why not crowdsource, ask people what they think of this, and see what solutions come up? I mean, negotiators have very little time to think creatively. Maybe the concerned public can give them some new ideas. So at that, I'll stop, because I don't want to go over my time. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and thanks to ASP um, for this conference. Uh, I'm going to make two and a half points. Uh, the first <laughs> point, for, for brevity's sake, the first point um, also uh, I, want to, I want to talk about geoeconomics as well. I want to say that I think we do need to have that kind of perspective if we want to understand the relationship between the multilateral system and TTIP. And what I, what I mean is that um, as the world gets more globalized, it also offers more opportunities for countries to pursue geostrategic ends using economics. Um, but I think what we're seeing is that that gets more complex as well, because we have a very diverse international economic system. Uh, and in that sense, I think it's not a coincidence that the term BRICS was coined in November in 2001, exactly the same time that the Doha run was launched. And I think that was a signal of the kind of complexity we were going to get and, and the difficulty that posed to the multilateral system. Uh, and so with the, what do I mean by this, this diversity of the international system? I mean that we have on the one hand, just to simplify a bit, countries like China and Russia, which have very status economies where state-run companies dominate. On the other side, we have the US, the EU, and Japan, which are very free market oriented. And then you have a bunch of countries in the middle, for, for example, Brazil and India, which I don't think fit very easily into a, a pure more purely status or more purely free market approach. And uh, this diversity in the, Jew, in the, in the global economy, uh, as I think has been mentioned by a couple of people, is mostly about rules. What rules, how do we, how do we govern the behavior of state-run enterprises? How do we protect innovation and an open internet? Uh, how do we assure that companies act with transparency and according to high environmental and social standards? And so TTIP was not the cause of this diversity. TTIP, I think, is a symptom of this diversity, and I think it is actually uh, an actual response to this diversity by the US and the EU to try to guarantee that they have a, at least, if not the sole role, leading role in setting these rules. 
Um, and so I don't think TTIP was, in try TTIP was trying to do an end run around the multilateral system. I think in, it was really a, an attempt to create a two-speed system where some countries would go faster uh, and, and, in, and others in the multilateral uh, scheme of things would go more slowly. And I think that you can make an argument, if we're talking about the relationship between TTIP and the multilateral system, that there's, there already has been a bit of a catalytic effect. Many people say that NAFTA had that effect on the conclusion of the Uruguay round, which was kind of stalling. And I think if, for example, you might argue that, uh, the, that TTIP started to focus minds, and that may be one of the reasons. One, that the, multi, that the Doha round, after 12 years, was finally able to accomplish one thing, which was the trade facilitation agreement at the end of 2013. Okay, my second full point is about uh, this issue of integrating emerging economies into the, uh, into the global trading regime. And does TTIP, TTIP uh, have some kind of nefarious Im impact on that? Or on the contrary, does TTIP help to, to um, facilitate that? Uh, now, that one way to look at that is to say, uh, is to look around and see what kind of homegrown trade initiatives we have coming out of the emerging economies and to see if TTIP fits in with that. And I, th and if you, I think if you do that, uh, that, uh, as is normal from a diverse international economic system, you could, there's, there, the signs are kind of mixed, but I don't think at all we see a, a situation where there's kind of us versus them or the West versus the rest. Um, but there is a diversity. On one hand, we have uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, in Asia, uh, which, where China has a big role and where the standards are not very high, and which is something that probably would not promote the kind of trading regime the U.S. and the European Union wants. So on the other hand, you have in, um, in Latin America, you have the Pacific Alliance with Me Mexico, Chile, uh, Peru, and Colombia, which uh, is made up of market-based economies, very trade-oriented, very well integrated in the global trading regime. They make up 50% of Latin America's trade. And I think those countries are uh, natural allies of the US and the EU in terms of the kind of system we want. And I think they're also very natural candidates to dock on to TTIP if at the end of that negotiation it's decided that the US and the EU will welcome more countries. Um, but you could argue that the test is not really whether you know, there's RCEP on one end and sort of Pacific Alliance on the other, but what about these countries that aren't part of any deals? What about um, what about uh, Indonesia or, or, or Brazil or, or Turkey or, or South Africa? You know, they're, they're not, uh, India is part of RCEP, but all these other very important economies are not part of any deal right now. So, so what, you know, and what, what, what are they doing? Well, if, I think you take Brazil and Turkey, I think the signs are at least that TTIP is having a benign effect and possibly a mildly positive one. Look at Brazil, um, which is not a very outward-looking economy, has a very small percentage of trade and GDP. Uh, it needs to negotiate whatever it does with its Mercosur partners, uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina, some of whom uh, are even more further along in the status direction than Brazil is. Uh, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, uh, the uh, Rousseff government, uh, along with the Chilean government, in, which is in Pacific Alliance, have been talking about convergence. How can we make these two systems work together? Uh, and um, I think, and you've also, uh, you've seen Brazil individually trying very hard to revitalize its free trade negotiations with the EU. Uh, argument could be made that presence of TTIP helped incentivize that. Turkey also, to a certain degree, I think you could already make that case. Uh, the EU and Turkey are now committing themselves to renegotiating their customs union to modernize it, help it take into account more sectors, which not only will help the Turkish economy, it would help uh, create a situation where Turkey can negotiate a tr any kind of new trade arrangement with the U.S., whether it's a free trade agreement or eventually docking onto TTIP in a stronger fashion. Uh, there's a high-level committee between the U.S. and Turkey to talk about TTIP again. I think that the presence of TTIP has at least been neutral and perhaps helped some of these countries to, and, and their partners to think about ways to integrate more into the uh, global economy. Okay, my half point has to deal with uh, why TTIP has is, is, is been getting so many, uh, has, been the, has been on the receiving end of so many, um, uh, so much public criticism, particularly in Europe, and why the WTO and the Doha round have not. And I think that has to do with the fact that, as, as many have said, that TTIP has a lot to do with issues that dive into the domestic economy, like, like regulatory cooperation. Um, but I think if TTIP is successful at regulatory cooperation in a way that does not sacrifice high standards, then uh, it could be expected that those issues will move into the WTO. And if those issues do move into the WTO, 
uh, not necessarily in a multilateral way, more along the model of the government procurement agreement or the information technology agreement in a plurilateral way. But if that happens, I don't think it's to be excluded that WTO will come into for the same kind of criticism that, that the US and EU have for TTIP. And there's a precedent there, because if we maybe forget that before the Doha round was launched, uh, it was supposed to take place in Seattle. And in 1999, there was the Battle of Seattle when a lot of uh, NGOs and others were in the streets because of what they thought were the kinds of commitments that governments were going to make at the multilateral level, which were very advanced at that point. Now the d multilateral level in Doha around is, is trailing, and the avant-garde stuff is happening in TTIP. But if that stuff moves into the WTO, then I think uh, there's a, there's a, the, the, that the WTO will also come in for that kind of criticism. So I think what's happening is the w TTIP is in the avant-garde. It's sort of out there taking the flack. Uh, but it may not be alone if those sorts of issues are, uh, are, are generalized to the multilateral level. Uh, thank you. Uh, Joshua. Great. It's always dangerous to be the last speaker on the last time everybody wants to get into the conversation. There have been so many pieces that are there. So let me just kind of throw a few thoughts out there and get right into the conversation. Um, let me take a step back, especially since I'm not an economist, and I'll put that out there right up front. It strikes me that so often those of us in this room, the very fact that you're sitting here means that you have an interest in this, and those of us that, that study these issues, uh, there's a real disconnect between those of us who are focused on the, the substance of things as we've been sitting here. TPA has been, you know, has just passed the, the Senate. We're going to get down and look at the details of this. All of us will have, you know, minute details that we want to understand. And those minute details have big impact. And businesses are out there analyzing it. The private sector is very keen on specific areas of this. But I think we have a real communications problem. We have a real gap in the way that we've talked about these free trade deals. And, you know, as someone who's worked in the administration and also now is in the private sector, who works on strategic communications, I, I think it would be remiss if I didn't simply point out the fact that, you know, these free trade, trade deals are a big deal. This is the legacy of this administration. If these trade deals that, that come out uh, are, are, are going to be successful, we've got to do a better job of marketing and, and kind of selling these. And I think one of the challenges we've heard from the very beginning of, of our discussion so far has been this dichotomy or kind of this, this seeming competition between TTIP and TPP. Now, sequencing is one thing. I think Kurt Tong, among others, uh, and I think our next panelist as well will have a chance to talk about this <laughs> perfect timing. Um, will be the discussion about you know, how this plays out politically, how the domestic political realm will play out. But I, I think one of the challenges is they are you know, the, the same side of different coins, or the same, you know, different sides of the same coin, whichever analogy you want to use here. And I want to use an example here to kind of, uh, kind of crystallize this. We've been talking about uh, this panel is supposed to focus on the emerging market side of things. And it strikes me that the interesting thing about Turkey, which I know best, and, and the role uh, for TTIP, it seems that it's a no-brainer, right? Turkey already has a customs union with the, United, with, with the European Union. It's one of America's closest partners in the region. There's a trilateral relationship that has historically always been there. So therefore, this makes common sense. I think I agree with what Dan said earlier. Mexico, Canada, and Turkey seem to be these special exemption cases because they already are part of some type of free trade zone, whether it's NAFTA or whether it's uh, being part of the European Customs Union. So therefore, all it takes is one more link to kind of bring these together. It is fundamentally different than a Brazil or Indonesia a few other cases, and yet there's more contention in Turkey and TTIP right now. There's more possibility that the Turks are not only going to, they can't stop TTIP from moving forward. They're not in the EU. They're not members of that discussion. But they can be very dangerous spoilers. And the way in which the rhetoric and the political uh, kind of fire that's going back and forth because of domestic political issues in Turkey, and also because of the perception gap that we've created in terms of Turkey's transatlantic anchor of NATO, et cetera, this seems to me a very obvious place where you let the economics play itself out and try to kind of separate it from the politics. Instead, TTIP has gotten caught right in the middle of these political tailwinds. And instead of leaders kind of leading on public opinion, they're being driven by public opinion. That's a real problem, I think, for those of us that care deeply about this. And I think the issue here is uh, it seems obvious that with Prime Minister Abe's visit in a couple weeks that TPP is on the front of the agenda, and that's the reason TPA passed today. That's why we're getting things done as quickly as we can. And there's almost a resigned kind of acceptance that, well, of course, TPP and then TTIP will come. Um, that's not the way it could have been. That's not the way maybe it should have been in some ways, the way, the way these things played themselves out. But unfortunately, you have to deal with these politics. And I think that the challenge is when you have these major uh, discrepancies and perceptions, I think we've already talked about it in the earlier panel, 
the, the idea is there's a screaming group of opponents to this who, you know, instinctively are anti. And, and I think you see this very strongly in the Democratic caucus in, in many ways. And you have this awkward situation when the administration, which is from one party, is relying on the opposition party to get things done in a Republican-controlled Senate and, and House. And it seems that the Senate, this is not going to be that big of a problem because getting a certain number to go along will be fine, whether it's TPP or TTIP. But I think on the... On, on, uh, where we move forward in the House is going to be very difficult. And I think when you listen to the politicians in this country, it's very interesting to hear what they say. And it was very, inter very interesting to listen to what the Dutch minister had to say. You know, the Dutch have not been, uh, they are clearly free trade oriented. This is clearly in their best interest. You haven't heard them step up as much as they have. And so them having a coming out party as they are today is significant. And we should think about what that means. And so I think the question here becomes, uh, how do we include these emerging markets that we're talking about? And how do we link uh, the TPP and TTIP into this larger uh, area in which we can have these conversations where not as economists, but more on the political level, you can sell it and you can have leaders who are not trying to be spoilers throughout. And I think at least in the case of Turkey that, that, that I've been studying, one of the challenges is to find mechanisms that right in the short term, it doesn't make any sense for them to be included. We don't even know what the framework looks like. We don't even know what the final agreement's going to look like. But there needs to be those assurances, right? And I think as, as Peter has already alluded to, there are these mechanisms put in place of kind of U.S.-Turkish strategic discussions, there are these different places, but they all seem to be in reaction as opposed to being proactive in some ways. And the challenge becomes, how do you basically kind of stage this uh, correctly? How do you let the administration lead here? And how do you kind of let uh, the business associations and others that should be the biggest champions step out in front? And so often, uh, the private sector is kind of very, uh, very active in a lot of these areas, but they only come in at the last moment, only when they know the terms of the deal as opposed to kind of being champions throughout. And there's some real cost associated with that. And so I think that that area is something we need to discuss. It's also going to be something that I think in terms of the, the legacy that we leave uh, with this administration in terms of the idea of economic statecraft, commercial diplomacy, thinking about all the different levels at which this administration has been firing on, particularly with only two years left, it's going to be very important. So I think uh, for me, the litmus test will be watching not just whether or not these deals get done, it's how they will be framed. I think earlier Dan Hamilton said, look, it's very lazy to say that the, this is simply a way of containing China. And I would agree, right? This needs to be something much broader. It needs to be seen and framed in terms of a trilateral discussion in which we look at uh, Asia, Europe, and the United States, and we look at them and saying, okay, who wants to reach these standards? You know, China can ultimately join TPP at some point in time. Turkey can join TTIP at some point in time if they reach certain standards, and we use it as a carrot. Just in some ways, this might be a bad analogy, as EU membership used to be seen as the gold standard. So I agree with what you're talking about in terms of having some type of gold standard that people will be attaining towards, but not trying to discourage people before they've even taken their first step towards it. So I'll end there so we can have a, a more fruitful conversation. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, no, Joshua, thanks. Uh, and our final uh, panelist is Christopher Smart. He's the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for International Economic Affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining well, I, I, um, I guess I'm louder here than I thought I was going to be. <laughs> uh, first of all, apologies for coming in late, and I'm also glad I got here just in time, apparently. So um, uh, it has been a, uh, a busy day, a busier day than usual. Uh, in our offices, first and foremost, you, I understand, have heard the news that the TPA bill has now been introduced, and so we have something to work with and something to move forward on. Um, uh, you, you mentioned it, it, it had been passed. It got, Sorry, still got a long way to go. I was, I was getting excited for a minute. <laughs> um, but there is, <clears throat> there is a long, long way to go. But it is an exciting day for us because we've been working very hard to get to this point. Uh, and what we think this is is a very important first step in uh, delivering on the president's trade agenda. Um, you may have read the Washington Post story this morning about the president's long history of um, uh, thinking and his approach to trade. Uh, I think trade has become a real uh, priority and a real centerpiece of his economic, his international economic policy. Uh, we have now a full-throated campaign uh, with a uh, headquarters in the in the white in the West Wing that meets every day that coordinates all of our efforts across the administration, uh, from the agriculture secretary to the um, uh, CEO of OPIC, who is across the tower here, uh, to make sure everyone is lashed up to push this administration's agenda forward on trade. When you have TPA, uh, it opens up the possibilities of negotiating both TPP, as you know, and TTIP, the subject of our conversation today, 
that will put the United States at the center of two free trade zones representing two thirds of the global economy. And so we think the, economics, the, the economic case is compelling for that fact alone, which is if you are looking to set up a manufacturing uh, operation or really any business, uh, not only do you have the um, highly skilled workforce, you have the protections for your intellectual property, you have a court system and a reliable rule of law, uh, you then add on to that access to affordable energy and now a free trade area that encompasses most of the major markets around the world. We think that really does uh, significantly advance the way people will look at the United States, both for an investment uh, and for, for commerce. There are really three aspects, I think, of this trade agenda. Um, and I may have covered some of this in previous panels, and so I apologize if some of this may be repetitious, but this is really the way we look at it. Um, there is obviously the economic argument. We have very low tariffs here. Other parts of the world have very high tariffs, uh, relatively. Uh, not necessarily so much in average, but in certain key, um, certainly agricultural or some industrial sectors. Uh, those are markets that we want to open up for our companies here uh, and create opportunities for American workers and for American businesses. Uh, a second very important part of all of this is the, uh, the disciplines, the standards, the rules that are enshrined in these arrangements. Uh, they will be guided the, by what is uh, set forth in the Trade Promotion Authority Bill that was dropped today in terms of the kinds of things our negotiators will be bringing back, uh, rules for good labor practices, environmental standards, uh, and d disciplines for state-owned enterprises, uh, a whole range of things that countries are signing up to, uh, in part because they want access to the United States, uh, to the US markets through these agreements. Uh, I'm speaking particularly of TPP right now but in part because they also want to be the ones setting the standards for global commerce in the 21st century. So we think that's a very important part of what we're doing. And I think you know, the president talks about uh, improving on past trade agreements. This is very much at the heart of what he means, which is making sure that the agreements are not only fair for American workers, enforceable, because a lot of these things had been mentioned in previous agreements, are now central and enforceable parts of these agreements. Um, uh, and really, if you got these agreements alone without the tariff and market access parts, they would be you know, enormously important on their own. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, the last part, the third part I would mention is the strategic part. And this is something that obviously is very important in Asia. You've heard a lot, read a lot about our rebalance to Asia. Uh, balancing uh, a very important military commitment to that region with a deep economic engagement. Again, setting the rules with partners in that area. It's probably not a coincidence that the early stage, the initial group of members uh, in the TPP negotiations are countries with whom we have a broader um, strategic relationship. Clearly with Japan, there's a very important defense component, Australia uh, and others, but even those where there's not an explicit defense arrangement, there is clearly a, a political understanding of how uh, we tend to see the world to, together. Uh, in TTIP, I you know, will digress briefly and tell you that to me personally, the strategic element of TTIP is almost, um, is, is more important than the economic. I mean, the economics are clearly important and I'll come back to those. But uh, you know, I think those of us who follow U.S.-European relations over many years, uh, the great shame of it all is how often and how frequently we are tempted to take one another for granted. And that uh, the importance of seeing past our differences, uh, resisting the temptation to poke at one another, and really understanding the bigger game, which is that uh, you know, this continues to be a dynamic world with unexpected challenges, as we've learned in the last year, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, and when the U.S.-European relationship is aligned, um, it's not that it solves everything, clearly, uh, 
but everything becomes that much more easier, uh, that much easier, and uh, other things become much more possible. Uh, just to step back on, in terms of the economic importance of TTIP, uh, one of the things, you know, when we talk about including others, uh, I think these are both agreements that will have open architectures that at, you know, at some point there's no reason why others could not join. But uh, we're talking about you know, two very sophisticated economies with two very high levels of development in terms of legal infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure, um, uh, standards that consumers and businesses expect to live by. And what we are doing here is, uh, is incredibly difficult because it's not a, a simple effort of reducing tariffs. Not that that's an easy part of it, but it really is reaching across the border into one another's uh, uh, internal organization and saying, uh, you know, if we can align things better across a range of particularly regulatory processes, uh, it opens up an enormous set of new perspectives and horizons for our businesses. And it sounds good and it sounds easy, but of course uh, it is not. And it is a very difficult set of um, very sensitive issues to be explored. And it really is kind of interesting, I think, to me that uh, it highlights how uh, I think when you get lazy, you sort of assume that Europe and the United States basically see the world in the same way. And then sometimes you're shocked at how uh, we don't. Uh, and one example I keep coming back to, and it, it comes up very frequently in a range of trade issues, but um, it was explained to me by a friend that the, the problem basically with our US-European relation, trade relationship is that Americans um, hate dirt. And they were wash their food in baths of chemicals again and again and again to make sure that there is not the slightest uh, bacteria or uh, smudge on anything that they will bring into their homes and wrap it in several layers of cellophane. Europeans uh, hate chemicals and will, this is a slight exaggeration, but they are much more comfortable with the world as it is and uh, not so comfortable with things that come out of test tubes and things that come out of um, uh, men and women wearing white, white lab coats. And I think that is a, is, a, is a gross generalization to be sure, but I think that underpins a whole lot of the differences we have with one another across a wide range of issues. So with that piece of eternal wisdom, let me, let me stop there and <laughs> listen to your thoughts and questions. Uh, thank you so much. As a, uh, a European who's lived here for eight years, it's still the tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> the Venus and Mars. <laughs> yes. uh, we've got about 15 minutes uh, for questions, but, but I, I'd like to thank you, first of all, because we've all sort of touched on this view of how we bring other countries and other regimes into the, tr the trade agreement. Is this just purely economics, or is, can this be extended in, in the sort of political factors that we saw, like this that Josh raised about the EU, um, you know, the, the, the four tests, uh, the four point pillars that countries have to be to join the EU? Is this the sort of thing we're, we're thinking of, uh, of not just economics, uh, tariffs, and regulations, but also um, how countries govern themselves? Well, I'm happy to. Yeah. Take a stab at that. I, I think that um, you, know, you do have to take a, that from a trade policy and pol trade policy making standpoint. What I mean by that is that if the, is that is that uh, if the U.S. And the, and the EU don't have the time and the space and 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 don't give the negotiators that time and space to 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 do the deal seriously, there's no deal worth joining. You know so. I think that um, it's it's we should be, and I think it's been said. I think you said that that, that they both or both agreements, TPP and TTIP, are open for docking once they're done. But I personally don't see how you create an agreement uh, that's worth docking onto if you sacrifice any at least of the trade policy requirements of how you get a good deal and you shortcut that. Then there's no deal that's worth that's worth joining. I think. I have a very different perspective on this. Uh, it's, uh, when I talk to Europeans, they're feeling very frightened strategically because of changes in Russia's behavior. Uh, whether you're Estonia, whether you're 
you live in Estonia, whether you live in Sweden, whether you live in Denmark, you can't uh, divorce the economic insecurity. And um, so thinking about it from geopolitical, I think if, and it's a big if, but I think it's an if that I think will happen. If the United States and the EU can get it together, and the EU and Canada have already gotten it together, and it says something about whatever this word, these two words mean, Western values. And that makes the notion that Western values become the values by which we govern, by which we treat the rule of law, by which we discuss the relationship between employment and trade, or privacy and trade, right? And I, and I otherwise, I mean, when I go and talk to people, let's say in public citizen, um, I feel like the agreement is never good enough, but yet they have this naive notion that we shouldn't have a consensus on these things. And it's my understanding as a student of economic history that that's why we created these institutions, that we need to establish those shared norms. So geopolitically, it's very important that we move it ahead. It can be an incentive to Russia. It can be an incentive to China. I'm hopeful. Just a tangential sort of response. In the sense, in the, in the sense of the TPP, I'm not sure that the world is all that enamored of, of submitting to a US hegemonic system. And with the, T, with the TTIP, with the, with the US and EU hegemonic system, you talk to Singaporeans and Australians and other countries that are involved in the TPP, they, want, they don't want to have to choose between the U.S. and China. They want, they want to play the U.S. and China off against each other economically. And, and I think it's, oh, it's strictly about economics. It's, it's, it's the U.S. more than anybody else, I think, that thinks <coughs> about Excuse the me. security dimension, and EU to some extent, but the other countries are looking for the best bang for their buck. I just pick up and I, I, I let my, my colleague speak, obviously, but he, 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 I thought he made a really good point and it ties directly to what we heard in the very first panel where the general basically said, this is America's most important security asset, these trade deals. And I think so often in policy making and even in, in kind of the way we describe things, we separate the two. So this is an economic issue or security issue. And I think we're seeing very clearly, particularly with TTIP, more than any, any, anything else, how important it is. And, and he said just a second ago, you know, the more important issue is, is kind of the geostrategic one here in some ways. And so whether or not, um, you know, French cheese is classified in a certain way under TTIP or not, that, you know, I think in some ways that's not the issue. It's the overarching kind of uh, reassurance it gives to the markets when the EU and the US are able to come together on this and come to an agreement where then they're able to kind of say, look, this is the, the playing field, this is the gold standard by which we play, and we will of course open it up in the future, but let's first get this deal first. And I think that security element that we saw Ash Carter talk about as he went out to Asia, you know, it's very impressive to watch the Defense Secretary give a lecture on these economic issues far better than almost any, uh, any other people have in the administration. So I think that's really important to point out. And uh, having just come back from the, the Baltics uh, a few weeks ago, they're, they're really for this, for, uh, for the security, more than anything else. Uh, take a couple of questions. Uh, Philippe. That's a good point. Thank you very much to everybody. It's been really interesting. Um, a question to all of you, not a personal position, but um, it seems to me there's a huge disconnect, and it's very interesting to hear you all talk about values. Um, what America, what the Western world stands for. Um, I would agree that a lot of politicians in Europe would probably think along the same lines without necessarily uh, speaking them out. But actually one of the big things about TTIP which make people worried in Europe is um, the fact that it's seen as a NATO by the back door, sort of having to um, help America um, um, offset China, um, Right now, yes, the Baltics and the Poles are, uh, are um, justifiably worried about what's happening on the eastern fringes of, uh, of Europe. But a lot of other Europeans are like, well, we don't want to follow the Americans in some um, crazed um, Cold War um, re re reshaping. Uh, and that's my question to, to you. When I hear panels here in the US, I always hear this shared values, um, you know, um, you almost never hear it in Europe. And I wonder when you were talking about indeed uh, chemicals and, and dirt, I think this is also something which is uh, really at the heart of some of the differences that we, we are seeing on both sides. But it'd be interesting to, to have your, your point of view on that. 
I th it's funny because I was thinking, I was totally, I made my points and then I totally agreed with Dan about how many countries don't want this hegemonic US vision. And certainly that's true in Europe as well. But when I talk about shared values, what I talk about um, are values about how governance should be conducted. Um, that doesn't mean that we have the same governance, right? But it's about the how. And so who should be involved? Uh, how we discuss issues, what should be shared with the public, how, when the public gets to discuss ideas, et cetera, um, how justice should be delivered, et cetera. We, we disagree on the specifics, no doubt, right? There are different libel rules in the UK than there are in France. There's a different perp walk in France than there is in the United States. I, but I think you get my point. The rule of law. It wasn't until recently that I saw the United States abandoning the rule of law out, uh, regarding malware. But in general, you see countries, Russia, China, ignoring the rule of law or not working to set up the rule of law. And so to me, again, if we can, you're right, we're going to disagree on the specifics. The United States and the EU are never going to find common ground on privacy. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but we might find common ground how we deal with our differences in privacy. Uh, Peter. Yes, I, I think that one of the most interesting and frankly I think attractive things about trade policy is the way that it allows you to do values and interests at the same time. I mean, when we're, when we're pursuing high standards uh, for the environment or labor or for how companies should operate or how, what, what the role of SOE should be versus private companies, we're pursuing certain kinds of values that we have about the economy, how we should organize our economies, but they also serve our interests. They serve U.S. and European interests because in those kind of higher end values, I don't think there's a lot of space between the U.S. and Europe. I think in the United States we're more comfortable because of our political and historical tradition talking about values in foreign policy. And we have a lot of foreign policy debates where we say that kind of humanitarian intervention would be support our values, but it may not support our interest. I think in a lot of trade policy, we don't have that kind of dichotomy. So it would not worry me that in Europe they're not talking about values. It would worry me if in Europe they're not talking about interests. I, I, I'm not sure I have much more to add. I mean, I think what, what Susan said is right on in the sense that uh, Europe and the United States may come out differently on how a particular regulation is written. Uh, I think we should try to do our best to align them because that opens up business opportunities. But I think the key element is not the final regulation or rule, but how it is arrived at with the transparency, with the input from the business community, and done in the, in the context of a democratic uh, system. And, and again, I, I, you know, we talk about, uh, I, I'm always a little interested that when, when, when we talk about shared values, it turns into American hegemony. You know, these we have things that we think are important in the way societies should be organized. Europe has the same. Um, when we line up the lists, there's an enormous amount of overlap. So it's not a sense of, I think, our imposing anything on anyone else. It's trying to do what we can to make the most of that overlap. Um, question for uh, Jeff. Oh, yeah. One observation and one question, uh, Geoffrey Harris from the European Parliament, the Secretariat, not a member of the Parliament. Just to remind, I mean, I totally agree with, with what, what has been said about the common value, but the issues of um, NSA surveillance are still out there. And there was a rather large country, Germany, where it plays very big in public opinion and in the Bundestag, as well, of course, uh, in the uh, European Parliament. But since, as you rightly mentioned, we live in democratic societies uh, here and, and Europe, uh, a question probably to Christopher. How does, this, how does the TTIP play out in terms of the presidential election and in terms of the f formation of a new administration? I'm not going to speculate publicly, obviously, about the timing of when negotiations can finish and all the rest of it, but in the, on the EU side, said we try and finish by the end of the year, then it was somebody who more or less unsaid it the next day. Um, and then there are the question of ratification by the European Parliament, by all the national parliaments. So it's, it's a long process. Now, how, I mean, how does it work here? Does the world just end, even if uh, a Democrat takes over from a Democrat and uh, whatever happens in the Senate and the House? Uh, 
uh, is it a new world in the beginning of 2017 and you have to wait for months and months for USTR to be nominated? I mean, if the negotiations are still going on. I've heard Mr. Froman say, well, we have no problem. Even if there's an election, we keep on negotiating until the last day. But how realistic is that? Is this going to be an issue in the primaries, in the general election? And then, you know, I say, never having been here in an election year, how does it work? Does everything really grind to a halt? Uh, I just throw the question. I'm sitting here watching next year, of course, as well. Well, there are others who probably have different perspectives on the whole um, uh, campaign that is uh, approaching and the way we handle transitions here. I think uh, a disinterested observer would probably suggest that we don't handle traditions, uh, we don't handle transitions as um, elegantly as our European counterparts, um, but we, we handle them in our own uh, dramatic uh, ways. Uh, I think what is, I, I, would, I would offer two observations. One is um, we're kind of used to trade politics in the United States, and these are very difficult issues with a lot of grassroots support for one side or another. Uh, and this is something that we struggle with all, all the time. Um, what is interesting and maybe a little bit worrying is that trade politics are appearing in Europe for the first time with a full-throated um, set of very well-organized voices. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just makes it that much more complicated. Uh, we are committed to, the, the second observation I would make is that with TPA uh, now introduced and we hope soon to be passed, uh, it will apply to both agreements. And so we will not have any issues about you know, what it will take to bring a good agreement back for Congress to approve. That will apply um, through the end of this administration and I haven't looked at the fine print but more likely than not it will go on several years into the next administration so the next administration will be able to negotiate based on that framework. Um, the political alignments of the President and Congress will no doubt change but again I come back to the broad sense of shared uh, destiny that the United States and Europe face and that is something that I think is well understood by both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, so I'm not sure that it is going to be, uh, I'm not sure that no one will notice that the president has changed and that the US Trade Representative is a new person and makes, needs a couple of weeks to get uh, confirmed. Um, but I think there will be broad continuity. We are very committed to going as far and as fast as we can between now uh, and the end of the administration. Um, I, I we're, I, I promised a hard finish uh, just before 4.30. Uh, so I'd just like to thank uh, our, our panel. It's been a very interesting discussion. I think there's a lot to take forward, especially about defining and helping uh, communicate what our values are both here and in the US. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, ABCO, and uh, our uh, adjunct junior fellow, Hugo, who's helped organize all of this. Uh, comes of doing it with Harding. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you.